Hey, John Strohmeyer with Strohmeyer Law. We're coming back to answer your questions, advanced estate planning questions. What are some of the things that we need to address when we get beyond the basics? So we've got a number of questions lined up. Looking forward to everyone coming in so we can get some answers to you. Remember, uh, we do these live streams every other week on Monday. So if you've got questions, drop them in the chat or drop them as a comment to the YouTube video so that we know to answer your question next time. Just as a preview, while we're doing advanced estate planning kind of across the gamut, in two weeks, we're going to be answering some of your charitable planning questions. What happens if you want to leave some money to charity? How can you make that actually work for you and your family? Is it possible to get some benefits to squeeze some extra tax juice out of it for yourself, or maybe make the gift in such a way that you get to hold on to some of that, maybe hold on to a little more control. But that's two weeks from now. This time we're talking advanced estate planning questions. Let's go to that first question that we have lined up. So my revocable living trust was created when I lived in a different state. Do I need a new one now that I've moved to Texas? So this is going to be one of those it depends questions. First part, you're probably going to keep the same trust as its own legal fiction. Remember, a revocable living trust, any trust, is a legal fiction. It's not a separate entity. It can be a separate taxpayer for income tax purposes, but when it comes to what the state, you know, the state you're living in, Texas, California, Florida, when it comes to the state, we're going to treat that as a legal fiction. It does have some rights because it's creating a legal relationship, a fiduciary relationship between you, the trustee, and that property. But when you change states, laws change. So imagine Bob and Jane are living in California. They've decided for whatever reason, they're gonna leave California and move to Texas. Now in California, you pretty much have to have a revocable living trust to avoid just exorbitant uh, probate fees and times. It just doesn't make any sense to recommend anything other than a revocable living trust there for probate avoidance. They're moving to Texas. They've got this revocable trust. They have funded their assets into the trust. What do they need to do when they get here to Texas? Well, we're probably going to keep that trust around. Why? It still makes sense here in Texas. Even if we're not so concerned with having a revocable trust for probate avoidance, if you've got the trust in place, we want to make sure that you keep it around. You've already got it. Let's just keep it. But we want to make sure that we're giving it a little bit of a tune-up. Why? Well, that trust was designed and drafted with California law in mind. So it'll probably work here, but there are a few things we want to do to make sure that it'll work better here in Texas. Think about it as this. You know, in your car, you probably have a transmission that goes up to five gears. You prefer to drive in fifth gear if you're going down the highway, but if you bring a foreign trust, meaning any trust out from outside of Texas, well, it's kind of like driving in third gear, even though you want to do 75 down the highway. You can do it, but it's just not going to be the most efficient thing. So having that trust agreement updated to reflect the fact that you're now in Texas just means it's going to be a little more efficient here. Beyond that, beyond just having a Texas trust agreement, even if the plan isn't changing, you want to make sure your powers of attorney, your pour over will, those are all drafted with Texas law in mind. Again, if you're living here now, you want your document to be effective here in Texas. The thing that we'd be worried most about, your medical power of attorney is not a Texas medical power of attorney. There's a chance that your Texas doctors or a Texas emergency room won't accept that California power of attorney. So again, getting documents updated if you move to the state will make sure things are running effectively and efficiently for you. So you don't have to, but it's a good idea to make sure it works within the context of the laws that you're now subject to. So let's look at our next question. Turning to international tax questions, I need help filing an FBAR. Do I need a CPA or a lawyer? When do I need to do this? Now, the FBAR is the Foreign Bank Account Report. If you have a bank account outside the United States, and it has more than $10,000 for even a moment at any point during the year, congratulations, you need to tell the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network that you own that bank account. Now, it's not the IRS, 
but it is a Department of Treasury. Both of the, both the IRS and FinCEN are inside of Treasury. You have to tell FinCEN every year that you've got a foreign bank account with that, you know, every year you've got to tell FinCEN if you've got a bank account with more than $10,000 in it. Now, what do you need to do this? You can fill this out, do all of this online. You really don't need a lawyer to help you with this. Most CPAs who are familiar with this should be able to help you get this done. Depending on how their process is set up, they may do most of the work and have you do some of the final clicking. They, I've also seen CPAs who say, look, we're not going to do this. Here's the link. Here's how you can fill out the return by yourself. It's just beyond the scope of their practice. Now, this is something that every year that you have a bank account with more than $10,000, you have to tell FinCEN. It's just a requirement. Once you've got through that, then it's making sure you're reporting all of your bank accounts. There is recent case law that says, hey, if you have multiple bank accounts and you didn't report all of them, the penalties apply on a per account basis, not a per year basis. So this is something where the penalties, can, you know, they start in the thousands of dollars. They can be a certain percentage of the account. You want to make sure you get this taken care of as quickly and as soon as possible because the IRS will come down on you if they find out. Now, what happens if you have not filed your FBARs? Well, if you have not filed an FBAR and the IRS has not contacted you, the good news is there are programs for you. You will want to talk to your tax preparer. You want to make sure that they know that you're going to be going into one of these document uh, programs. The IRS knows that things happen. The key is to tell them before they find you. So go in. The delinquent document uh, programs will allow you to file returns, file these missing foreign disclosures. As long as it didn't affect your tax liability, you're able to get through the process, get cleaned up, and go forward knowing it's been resolved generally without penalties. Now, if this is something where you not only didn't file and you also have some tax liability that you have to deal with, then there are different programs, but you'll want to make sure that you're talking to your CPA. You may need a lawyer to help you just manage the process, protect your rights, make sure you're not going to get in more trouble. Again, FBARs, along with other foreign disclosures, need to be filed generally on an annual basis. CPA should handle most of this. You're not going to need a lawyer to prepare those forms for you. No, for my practice, even though we think about things like this, the reporting is done by CPAs and enrolled agents because they're the ones who are preparing those annual returns. It's just better handled by those folks who are hand handling the annual returns. So again, make sure you get those returns in. The IRS does look at this. You And if you misstepped, in filing, make sure you get it cleaned up as soon as possible. This is not something where you can afford to wait for the IRS or hope that they're not going to find you. All right, let's look at the next question. Now, in terms of tax planning, if you're making more money this year and you think your tax bill is going to be higher, will a trust help? Can you do anything? You know, first things first, congratulations, you're making more money. The result is going to be, yes, you are going to be paying more in tax. Can a trust help? Answer, probably not. Now, in this, I'm really only thinking about income tax planning, where we've talked a lot about estate and gift tax planning. If you put some of that money aside, you put it into a trust, you're taking that off your estate tax ledger, so it's not subject to estate tax when you pass. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to put that wholly to the side. Again, Bob and Jane, they have been making more money this year. They're thinking about their own 1040. What can they do to minimize that? Could a trust help? Again, probably not. Now, there are three types of trusts we typically think about. Revocable living trusts. Now, this would be a trust that Bob and Jane create for themselves. They put their assets in, and then they're going to have the benefit of those assets. Type 2, a, or a, a lifetime or inter vivos gifting trust. Bob and Jane are going to take that extra money they've made. They're going to give it away to somebody else. Again, this is the estate and gift tax plan, not what we're talking about. Type three, testamentary trusts. So this is a trust that's going to be created after Bob and Jane are dead, probably for their kids or grandkids. Well, 
they're making more money, we're probably not thinking about them passing anytime soon. So we're not going to talk about that. Really, we're focused on the first time, the revocable management trust. What you need to know about these trusts, these trusts are all for the benefit of Bob and Jane. They put money in there, it's for Bob and Jane while they're alive. There's not going to be any income tax planning benefits for them because all of that income is going to come right back out to them. Even if it didn't, if it's a revocable management trust, well, because it's revocable, the IRS is going to treat all of the assets inside that trust as being owned by Bob and Jane. They're not going to have anywhere else it can go. If we started thinking about, well, what about those irrevocable trusts, the, the lifetime trust? Can't we put our money in, an, in a trust for our own benefit? The answer is no. It's still going to be treated as owned by you. So the key is once you've got these income, you know, once you've got this additional income, a trust isn't really going to change much. When we think about what we can do with trusts for income tax planning, it's really thinking about how can we minimize the income tax burden on somebody else. You know, for those lifetime gifting trusts, we may put assets in and then keep on getting taxed on them, even though the assets are for the benefit of our kids or further descendants. That allows those assets to grow tax-free effectively because we're paying the tax but they're getting the benefit. So short version, unfortunately, if you're making more income, which is a good thing, you are not going to be able to use a trust really to minimize your own income tax burden. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next question. Another trust question we get a lot. Look, I'm about to be sued. I'm worried about getting sued. Can I put my stuff in a trust and protect it from my creditors? This comes up a lot. People have heard about domestic asset protection trusts. You know, Bob's out there working hard and somebody has threatened to sue him, whether or not it's a valid suit. He wants to protect what he's earned from these people who are coming to try and take it. Can he put his stuff in a trust? Again, you can put it in a trust. It's not going to give you a lot of protection. First off, those three types of trusts, a revocable management trust that Bob and Jane would set up for themselves, Type 2, an irrevocable lifetime gifting trust where they're putting assets away for somebody else. Finally, a testamentary irrevocable trust that they're setting up for their kids and grandkids. Well, we're not talking about Bob and Jane dying anytime soon, so we're going to take those irrevocable testamentary trusts off because we're not looking at that. The irrevocable gifting trust. So irrevocable trust meaning we put stuff in and we can't take it out. This isn't going to work generally because of two things. First, if Bob and Jane put assets in an irrevocable trust for themselves, Texas law is going to look and say, well, look, this is what we call a self-settled trust. When you create a trust for your own benefit, even if it's irrevocable, there are all sorts of rules that say, look, you can't put stuff out of the reach of your creditors, but still have it for your own benefit, especially if you're doing it with a trust. So that sort of putting it in an irrevocable trust for your own benefit not going to help. What if you put it instead in an irrevocable trust for your kids? Well, that may work. What we're going to want to look at is, hey, were you solvent at the time that you made that gift into the trust? If you were, you know, if you had extra capacity to make a gift, you know, if you if you're only being sued for a million, but you had two million, potentially you could have given away a million dollars because that's above what you were reasonably going to be sued for and collected upon. That may work. And the key, though, for those irrevocable trusts, it's not going to make sense unless you're giving it away to somebody else. Finally, a revocable management trust. This is something where, again, you're putting a trust in place for your own benefit. It's something you can unwind at any time. There's not going to be any asset protection for you there. Well, because you can unwind it, you can put the stuff right back in your pocket. There's not going to be any protection from an, a, from a revocable trust. So, and setting up a trust really is not going to do a whole lot of good for you when you already know about this lawsuit. It's possible if you're not worried about a lawsuit at all, no reasonable expectation, setting up trust, starting to give things away now, that could work. But just setting up a trust and even including... You know, I'm going to put all my assets in my wife's name or all in my kid's name. 
it's not going to do a whole lot to generate any protection. It's not going to do a whole lot to do anything other than delay your creditors, which the whole point of fraudulent transfer laws is to stop you from playing games with your creditors. If you owe, an, owe a debt, you're going to need to pay it. So, uh, so if you owe that debt, you go ahead and you know, you're just going to have to deal with that. When it comes to something uh, like planning ahead for asset protection, starting now, moving things into trust may make sense. But if you already know about this lawsuit, you're probably too late. Next question. All right. Again, thinking about asset protection, what is a fraudulent transfer? Laws are set up in a lot of ways to make sure that people honor their obligations. When we think about somebody having a debt out there, whether they're getting sued for something they did or something they didn't, the law is in place to make sure that, that you know if somebody's been injured, they're going to get compensated appropriately. Fraudulent transfer and asset protection go hand in hand. We need to think about this because if you're going to get sued, the state gives you two things. The shield of asset protection. Here, I'm going to protect my assets. But there's also the sword for your creditor to say, yeah, you may be able to protect things, but fraudulent transfers don't allow you to take everything that I should have a right to get compensated with because I'm injured. And you can't just put it away. So a fraudulent transfer is there for creditors coming after a debtor to be able to get compensated, to be able to claw back certain transactions. Now, a fraudulent transfer is generally anything that's aimed at delaying, hindering, or just kind of slowing down a creditor. You know, you're trying to defraud a creditor from being able to collect a debt that they otherwise owe to you. What is it going to do? It's going to Say, if you gave something away that you shouldn't have, if you were insolvent, meaning you had more debts than assets, you couldn't give something away because you owed things to your debt. You owed a debt to somebody else first, and so you can't be charitable before you've been honest with the people you owe money. So a fraudulent transfer is any transaction that a creditor can basically unwind because a that debtor has gone and done something that really is just goes beyond the rules. So when we think about this, a fraudulent transfer, how would this look? Well, let's say you're getting sued or you think you're about to be sued. You go and transfer assets into the name of your wife, hoping they won't be able to find it. Or you give all of your assets to your mom because that way they're definitely not going to look her up and find her. This really is just gamesmanship. You're trying to retitle something in somebody else's name so people won't be able to find it in your name. Here's the reality. If you get sued, you're going to go through one level of a trial. And let's assume that at the end of the trial, you get a judgment that says, you know, Bob, you owe Bill a million dollars. There's going to be the next phase where Bill is trying to collect on that debt from Bob. This is not going to be a, you know, Bill's not just going to go and say, all right, well, give me a million dollars, and Bob, you know, kind of puts his head in the sand. Bill's going to be able to still use the court process to extract that million dollars. He's already got a judgment. It's not unfair or unethical for Bill to be able to collect that debt. So what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be some discovery. And this is a legal process where Bill gets to ask questions and get some straight answers from Bob. And Bill is going to be asking, what do you have and where do you have it? And Bob is not going to be able to, again, hide things. If he, you know, he's going, Bill is going to ask directly, what transfers have you made in the last six months to a year or whatever? You know, where are all of the assets that you could reasonably have a claim on? So Bob, as the debtor, is either going to have to say, well, I retitled my house in the name of my mother, or I transferred a million dollars out of my 401k and gave it to my brother. So he's either going to have to say that outright, in which case Bill can come back and say, that's a fraudulent transfer, bring that back in. Those are uh, assets I can reach out and attach my claim to, to be satisfied. Or Bob is not going to mention it, and then Bill is going to be able to get him for perjury. 
and then still have to unwind all those transactions. So when we think about fraudulent transfers, you know, pulling all of this together, this is all about how do we make sure that creditors who have a legitimate claim can have those claims satisfied. Fraudulent transfers basically is there to unwind bad actions on the part of debtors who just aren't playing by the rules. So make sure if you're thinking about asset protection, it's not just, hey, we need to do this now because the lawsuit's coming tomorrow. In that case, probably too late. Fraudulent transfers are going to be there to kind of poke a hole in that balloon. Let's go to the next question. All right. So thinking back about trusts, my adult son is an idiot and he's going to blow his inheritance as soon as he gets it. What can we do for him? Well, this is where, you know, regardless of his intellectual capacity, thinking about who our kids are and what does it look like, we want to make sure that we're getting things to, to them in a way that they're not just going to turn it into Maseratis and cigarettes the moment after they get it. This is where a trust can come in handy. Trust, when we think about trust, the two types of trusts we think about really are irrevocable gifting trusts and either set up during lifetime or an irrevocable gifting trust that's set up at death, being a testamentary trust set up in your will or a revocable management trust. Now, when we think about these things, a lifetime giving trust or a testamentary gifting trust, both are going to have a lot of common features you're going to be setting up rules on when and how money comes out of that trust. Think of a trust kind of like a bucket. You're going to put assets in and they're going to come out. Those, When it comes out, it's going to be called a distribution. And that distribution can be controlled by you as the person creating the trust. Should they get all the income that's generated by the assets? Well, that's one way money can come out of that bucket. Should they get money to buy a house? It's another way money could come out of the bucket. So you get to design the spigot at the bottom of the bucket that says when things come out. So when you think about your family, you know, your son, regardless of his capacity, when and how should he get the money? Putting those rules in place and saying, here, we're going to put the money so that you can only get money to pay for your education and we'll pay for an apartment not to exceed $2,000 a month or something. You can come up with those rules the second part then is who's going to enforce it? If you don't trust him with the money now, you may want to have a different trustee in place to own those assets for him. If you've got these assets, you know, this trustee, if it's not parent, family member, they're probably going to want to be compensated. You may even consider having a corporate trustee to manage this for you. So the bad, so the bad guy is you know, the corporate trustee, not some family member where it may cause family problems, where their, you know, your son is fighting against a family member to get money out of their trust. Again, a lot of this comes down to, well, what do you want it to look like? A trust is a good way to protect a beneficiary from themselves. You'll want to talk to your own advisor to make sure you're getting the right conditions in there and getting the right control so your son you know, gets to use the, the assets but doesn't necessarily blow it all immediately. Go to the next question. All right. When we think about trusts and asset protection, if a revocable management trust doesn't give us any asset protection, why are we even bothering? Well, tools can have multiple uses. And just because it doesn't have a use in one case doesn't mean it doesn't have other uses. For revocable management trusts, they're not going to give you really any asset protection. What they will give you are a couple other things that we do think about. Now, here in Texas, we're not so concerned with avoiding probate. Probate procedure here, more straightforward. We're still going to court. We still have things to do, but it's less involved than in places like New York, California, and Florida. So you can have a revocable management trust to bypass parts of the probate process. This may make sense in your family for a couple reasons. You know, one, we want to think about your beneficiaries. Are any of them going to cause problems? If they are, we may want that trust so that we can keep people from interfering in the process. If you're worried about somebody challenging your will, well, this is something else to think about. 
we, if we've got a revocable management trust, it's easier to put assets outside of the probate process so that somebody who may be upset with your plan can't challenge it directly. Similarly, we may want multiple trusts where different trustees have different assets because we want to keep people as far away as possible. So that's one thing. We're going to avoid some fights. Another thing, if you're getting beyond, you know, if you're getting up in years, past retirement age, we start thinking about things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia. Having a guardianship set up for you because you've lost capacity is an expensive probate process. And it's something that if you can avoid it by having a trust in place with somebody you trust to manage your assets for you, it'll help minimize the costs of that guardianship because there's another way to manage your assets for your own benefit. And that's what we want to think about is you're going to get a benefit of avoiding the delays and frustration of a, pro, of a probate guardianship proceeding. You'll avoid the costs of that. You may also avoid a fight among family members of who wants to be in charge because you get to pick who's in charge. Finally, a benefit on a revocable management trust. It just collects everything together. If you funded assets in the trust, it's easier to know what's in the trust, what you have actually funded in there, so that when you pass, it's less of a treasure hunt for your family because you've got this wonderful trust where you've listed out, you know, here are all my brokerage accounts, all the beneficiary designations point the right way into the trust. We know where to find everything. So even though a revocable management trust isn't great for asset protection, doesn't mean we don't have reasons that we'd otherwise think about it. You know, avoiding fights in probate, avoiding guardianship, or just generally putting things in place so that they can be more easily managed. Let's go to that next question. Now, another trust and estate planning question. Should you put your life insurance in a trust to avoid taxes? Well, first question, which taxes are we thinking about? If it's income tax, well, you're not going to avoid a whole lot of tax. If you're talking about estate tax, definitely we're going to think about it. So a little bit on life insurance. When you have life insurance, if you own it directly, that policy is going to be subject to estate tax when you die. And the amount that's subject to estate tax when you die is the death benefit. Whatever it's worth when you die, how much can you direct? So if you have a term policy worth $100,000, you die, well, if that policy was still in force, then that $100,000 is potentially subject to estate tax. So when we get clients with assets who are beyond the, the credit amount, so currently here in 2023, $12.92 million for a single person. And a married couple combined would have close to $26 million. We know it's going to drop in 2026 and be about $6.8 million. Again, if you're getting beyond that or if you're getting close to that, we may want to pull the assets out of your estate so that they're not subject to estate tax. That would be a reason to pull it out and put it into an irrevocable gifting trust so you no longer own it. That's going to pull that out and not have it be subject to estate tax. But when you put it in a trust, more than likely the income generated by that trust will be subject to income tax in your, uh, in your lifetime. Why? It's going to be what we call a grantor trust. So you, as the grantor of that trust, will be taxed on the income generated within that trust. For most life insurance trusts, this really isn't a problem. You're going to really just be putting cash in every year. You may not be putting any assets that actually generate income in. So the income tax hit may not be a whole lot. But the reason we put life insurance in trust, though, it's to save on future estate tax. The side benefits are the side benefits we think about with any trust. We're going to put some control and management, basically. We're going to have some guardrails we can put on the, those assets for the beneficiaries later on. So looks like that was our last question this week. Thanks for coming in. We're going to be back in two weeks. We're going to be talking about some more advanced charitable gifting options, what we can do with that, mix in some trusts. Thanks for stopping in. We'll see you next time.